I'm sitting here because uh, I have to control the computer, but I'm not here to give a lecture. I want it to be an open discussion, so feel free to cut in any time or ask questions or make comments. And before starting, I don't have answers to these questions. Um, to start with, like, um, why I'm here and why I'm doing this workshop and tomorrow there's a performance I'm doing is because um, I'm from Turkey, I'm an artist, part-time lecturer, and in 2013 uh, we had a big uprising in Istanbul, which is sort of uh, started similar with the uh, Maidan uprising here, and we can find uh, many common points, also a lot of differences, of course. And um, the series of workshops were called How to Continue, How to Archive, and How to Remember. We did the first part, How to Continue, and it was about, as the name of the, uh, the school is, uh, School of Lansom, what happens when the movements withdraw from the streets? So how do we deal with this moment of, like, really high moments and when they start to go down and we sort of I, I gave examples of smaller solidarity movements and organizations in Istanbul um, the second part is more about um, archiving and remembering which is also related with um, projects and art projects around this so uh, the idea came from um, this excessive information like when our uprising was over, I went back and I started to check like what articles were written, which images were put on internet, etc. Which also happened after Syntagma uh, Square, Piazza del Sol, or here. And we see this like websites of gigabytes of image, video, texts, timelines. And when I started to check all these images and texts around um, Gezi uprising in Istanbul, as a person who was there, I felt a lack. Something was lacking, even though there was a huge documentation of it. Um, there was something we couldn't uh, reflect enough. So, the first question I'm going to be asking will be, um, are the tools enough or uh, the civil documentation or individual documentation tools are enough and what are they covering, which sides of the facts are they covering and are they imitating the mainstream media or are they giving us enough space for alternative representations. And then I will go to the part um, after this heated moments are over if we go back to these archives, how we can create different kind, uh, models of documentation or different kinds of uh, artistic projects or sometimes organizational projects out of this kind of archives. So this is a picture of only one street uh, during the first night of the uprising and uh, there were at least like 100, 200 streets packed with people like this. And the first night, the first thing we realized was that none of the mainstream media was showing this. Like in uh, CNN Turkish, they were showing a documentary on penguins and they were showing movies in other TV channels, which was one of the most historical uh, moments of Turkey. And this was the real image, but they weren't showing <coughs> all this. So, um, as soon as people realized that this movement and this uprising is not represented in the mainstream media, they suddenly and spontaneously started to create their own media. So this is another historic moment that, um, as in here, we have two bridges connecting the Asian side of the city and the European side of the city, and they are uh, only open to cars. Usually you cannot walk uh, through those bridges as a pedestrian, 
but people for the first time like managed to walk through and come to the other side to, to help the people uh, on the other side. And we have only three or four pictures of this historic moment because like no journalist was there, no television was there. There are only like some iPhone pictures uh, of this moment. So there is another one taken from uh, a building close by people crossing the bridge. These are photos, I just wanted to give an example how big the, the situation was. Um, this is the street that protests were happening and the cloud you can see is the tear gas that police was throwing. It was that big that um, it almost obscured whole city center. And this is a picture from the very first night. The things you can see on the ground, they are not stones, they are um, the capsules, gas capsules that police throw. And uh, after the first night, they said like they spent two tons of gas capsules just in one night. And the second night, they have to ask more from Brazil, like to export, <laughs> import more gas. So this is showing like two different uh, television channels side by side. One is really local and um, no, the, the one on the right is international Siena. If you are in the United States, you can see what's going on in Turkey. And the left one was uh, Turkish Siena, which was showing a penguin documentary. And somebody took this picture side by side, showing the difference. And this soon became a joke uh, between the protesters. So there was this image created saying, resist Antarctica. And people, the protesters, started to call, call themselves penguins. And there were a lot of stances with uh, penguins with gas masks were created. <clears throat> so uh, to go back to this um, archiving and documenting, this soon became an awakening for us. Like, the media is not showing. So a lot of Facebook and Twitter pages were created. But then the police also discovered these alternative media pages and they started to create um, fake accounts to mislead the protesters. So the doctors were trying to help the wounded, so police was saying from Twitter that there is someone wounded in this corner, people were running there, no one was there. So they were using Twitter to um, uh, uninform people or uh, misinform people and also um, create panic inside the crowd. So the second day suddenly appeared this web page saying uh, the Twitter users that you can trust. So it's a still active web page that um, some people of trust, journalists and uh, people we know that they are not lying. Uh, you can find their names and um, their tweets in a news feed. So a lot of web pages as well created that um, showing pictures that we couldn't see in the mainstream media. And some web pages were only dedicated to live stream. They are still functioning. They are uh, making live stream from every protest or action or clashes. And there are some uh, real journalistic web pages. Uh, here you can see a couple of them combining um, articles, cartoons, uh, animations, um, videos, and photos. So I'm not questioning all of these efforts to create a new kind of media, but after checking all of them like with detail, um, if you if you look at them closely. It made me question that are we imitating the mainstream media? Why I'm asking um, this question is, these are all pictures um, taken from these alternative media pages. And if you look at the majority of the images, you can see most of them are from barricades, things burning, people getting hurt, um, clashing with the police. And um, it somehow imitates the sexy images the mainstream ma media was also claiming sexy like this clash violence uh, barricade aesthetic even we can call it clash porn they uh, in greece they especially call it um, clash porn so 
So a couple of examples from the same repetition of images. So what is the danger of this kind of um, representation is that if we are talking about a movement which occupied the land in the city center for 20 days, it wasn't only about clashes. Of course, there were people holding the square, like with the barricades, um, avoiding the police to enter. But inside the park, there was a lot of other work was being done, like people were um, trying to create a life there. And it wasn't only about violence or barricades or clashes. So uh, another phenomena was this heroic moments of the protesters, which suddenly we realized after appearance of a couple of pictures, like this heroes clashing with the police, people started to act to cameras. They started to pose for the cameras. And there were a um, couple of pictures started to repeat itself, like someone going naked in front of the water cannon, someone sitting with the LGBT flag, again, in front of the water cannon, lying in front of the police. So as I said, like when I go back and start to look at the web pages, the first thing you realize is that almost 80% of the pictures are clash pictures and barricade pictures and things burning and there's gas and this kind of clash porn I mentioned. And the rest of the 20% I call the hippie-ish moments that people are um, showing their affect and love to, to the police. So, um, or the cute protesters to change the public opinion or either they're like, um, yeah, like, she's a friend, don't get me wrong, like I know her personally, but um, uh, having a clown outfit and um, talking with the police or he's another friend, I also know him personally, reading book to the police yoga sessions in the park <laughs> to show that we are constructing a life so we eat breakfast and we make our yoga and of course the music but with the even though it's not necessary at that moment with the gas mask Another piano recital uh, inside the crowd. People hugging the trees and dressing the trees. Uh, did, did this policeman uh, take the flower? No. no. <laughs> they never did. They didn't take the food either. Um, we always talk about it actually that in many protests, I think here as well it happened, like some police changed sides. But it seems that he... Uh, no? Yeah, no. I mean, in Turkey the police never changed side or never like commented uh, anything critical to the protesters. They were always like, like a wall. So as I said, when I go back and look at the pictures, I feel that um, something is not, not only one thing, but a couple of things are not represented. As I said, it's either the clash moments or this hippie-ish uh, peaceful moments are represented a lot, even in the alternative uh, media pages. Um, but as someone who was there more than clash, I know that uh, cooking or organizing the information flow or um, trying to create a life, making workshops, uh, negotiating with the government. There were a lot of uh, important things were going on which are not documented at all. Like you can only find a couple of pictures about this. Um, so what I can give as an example that the first night, uh, the only thing we could think of was blankets, tents and food, you know, like we asked people to bring these kind of material. And then we realized there are other things also important, such as electricity cables, scissors, paper and pen, 
Uh, and then the third day we realize we need toilet paper, hygienic pads, tampons, etc. So you keep discovering that you need more stuff and uh, you start to organize this kind of things. Or then uh, there are more abstract things to do. The undercover police was coming to the park and setting fire just to blame the protesters. So the third day there was a um, fire squad was formed by the protesters themselves. So we started to ask like fire extinguishers. And on the fourth day, some women started to say there are like men abusing them, so they formed the abuse team, catching those men and punishing them. So the life was creating itself and um, creating teams, creating organizational teams. So, um, which I uh, keep saying that it is not represented in articles, in newspapers, or in photography. So this is a picture I took, which is not a beautiful picture, so you cannot find it in this um, alternative media pages or mainstream pages, but this, is, this, is, this was the reality in the part that we need to communicate through these papers and people were writing and putting them and we are asking for volunteers and it was like all this kind of trash going on, different objects all together. Or, this free market, these poor guys were there for 14 days, like taking juice and biscuits and giving it to people. Or another picture I took, like this guy had to organize blankets and stuff for um, 15 days, which is not aesthetic at all. So I'm here, I, would, I, I want to um, jump to different kinds of uh, documentation and archive web pages. This is a meta web page uh, that was formed in Istanbul. Uh, I'm calling it meta web page because it's a web page gathering together all the web pages created during the uprising. So if you go to this web page, you can see all the web pages which was creating, created during the resistance. So. Um, this is the address, but we don't have internet here, so I cannot connect. Luckily, I got some screenshots. Um, one of the web pages that was created called Gezi Analysis, so it's still active and keeps posting all the articles and news writings um, to only one web, web page. There is another one called um, Resistance Walls, and it's only dedicated to the writings on the walls and their English translations for the um, audience abroad. Uh, here you can find thousands and thousands of um, wall writings. And this is the address of the wall writings. There is another one only dedicated to police violence. So they are only uploading videos uh, that are showing police violence and their uh, numbers on their helmets. <clears throat> and they are helping the human rights associations. Um, there is another one only dedicated to music created during the resistance. So there are only songs and uh, videos of the common singing moments. This is a sort of calendar uh, showing first day, second day, third day, etc. So you can see the chronology uh, with pictures and with some explanations. So before um, jumping to the other section, is there also here like this accessible web pages dedicated to different things? Any examples? Um, maybe I want to share my own experience uh, about um, uh, these different uh, levels and uh, ways of re representations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I um, um, made a design of a paper issue of Critical Politician magazine uh, devoted to my design. And it was a year and a half ago, and in that moment, uh, war starts, so the Maidan um, became like uh, not uh, most topic, uh, like most hot topic, but um, for us, for our uh, group of people, it was necessary to find uh, 
the way how uh, not lose this memory about this event. And uh, it was a like paper magazine, not uh, really big, so it's not internet page that, that you can put a lot. So I must uh, choose something. And uh, uh, when I went through internet and uh, was looking during days and days a lot of different pictures and be became very tired about this, I uh, I saw that um, there is, um, uh, like you uh, told this uh, porn, mainstream picture, uh, really d dominated. And uh, uh, there are a, a few topics of this. Um, uh, in one way, it's some, especially in Ukraine, it's like uh, patriotic um, mm. images, when people are singing uh, or with flag or something. And uh, uh, they are really um, like, um, hid something, some some, some uh, other reality. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, in one moment, and also with these pictures, a lot of pictures with fire, and uh, also we have uh, uh, the same uh, picture with piano, <laughs> when can you? And uh, I uh, felt that, how can I choose something uh, mm -hmm. in this uh, huge uh, information? And uh, the only way I found that uh, um, when some picture touch me, really deep, deep touch my own personal experience with this, then I can uh, choose it. Uh, not some, uh, maybe, rational, uh, uh, yes, not, um, it's not, uh, you not, must not follow really this mainstream uh, line but uh, to uh, find in your own experience some things which touch you and uh, and in, when you work in this way uh, not uh, really a, a lot of pictures do this effect so but in the other way it's important to show uh, what it was and show different uh, situations so um, i made the uh, also like in this website different topics uh, which must be represented like uh, um, preparing food and all this stuff uh, with, uh, with connecting with life, with everyday life, uh, then battles with the police, then violence and after my done and so, so on. Mm -hmm. So the things that is the same. But uh, it's also online, you said, right? Uh, this magazine? Yes. No, it printed in the uh, paper. Printed. Oh, okay. It's a pity that I didn't take it. I, but maybe later he has one. Uh, but um, we can uh, present you. <laughs> yes. Not present, but... Um, I saw, like, in Istanbul Film Festival, I saw this documentary, Maidan. Uh, what did you what, see? What kind? Yeah. It was like, there was no explanation, but only the camera yes. was fixed. Uh, 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 Sergei Lozmitsov? I think, like, I don't remember the director's name, mm -hmm. but... Um, very slow, slow and long. Yeah, he never turns mm -hmm. the camera where the action is. It's always like fixed. So I find it an interesting approach to mm -hmm. document because like in some, you can see something is happening there outside the camera, but as a decision, you don't see that part like the rest of the crowd or there were lots of um, parts showing people like preparing food or um, shelter. Mm -hmm. There are also another film, uh, it is called Everything is Basel, Sepala. Yep. A blaze. Yep. A blaze. Everything is a blaze. It uh, was made by a few journalists who worked as a mm -hmm. documentary uh, filmmaker at Maidan, and it's uh, uh, interesting that uh, they get it in, in that, from that point of view that they uh, fixed how uh, rude and uh, violence was from the side of uh, protesters. Mm -hmm. So uh, they made a few episodes when they were standing uh, uh, on the back of the police and uh, so it was like interesting that was represented the violence from the both mm -hmm. sides. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't see this film? No? No, no that's no? what I did but maybe I can find it online? Uh, mm, I think not yet. No. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I mean, um, as you said, like showing the other side, uh, we also discussed a lot when I showed these pictures that um, people reading to the police. 
A lot of protesters criticize this action, as if you are saying you are stupid and we are the educated ones, as if talking to the police and creating this like class difference between the police and the protesters and uh, calling the rest of the world stupid or idiotic. And um, I also saw like in the same festival in Istanbul, there was a, another documentary called Silvered Water, um, a director from Syria. And it was just the opposite of a Maidan movie because like, he made it with collage uh, videos. He collected cell phone videos, whoever wanted to send him. So he um, made this collage between these videos. But um, as in the movie Hiroshima Mon Amour, mm -hmm. he uh, voice over this uh, documentary images in a really poetic way. So as if it's a dialogue between, not as if it's a real dialogue between a Syri um, Syrian woman director who is still living in Syria and uh, another Syrian man director who flee to Paris. Mm -hmm. So they are sending images to each other and then they um, edit it to tell a story. So I think there are a lot of different approaches like in the way of representing it. So I will go back and show a couple of um, different projects about what people did afterwards, like reshaping all this um, documentation and archive and how they reflected on them. Um, and like there are only a couple of projects I want to show, uh, I think, which are which have interesting approach to this documentation and arch archive. Um, the first one is called Occupy Gezi Architecture. It's formed by um, um, urban designers and architects, but they existed before uprising. So their question was like, everybody can be an architect and everybody can be a designer, so we are always designing different stuff in their daily life. So um, what they did during the uh, after the occupation is they did architectural drawings of the architectural um, structures that people created inside the park. They call it architecture of emergency. They did it after the earthquake, uh, earthquakes as well, or like um, extraordinary situations. So this is the picture <coughs> of the real structure. And they did this like architectural um, drawing. of the structure. I will first show the real picture. <laughs> so it was sort of a couch designed by everyday objects by the protesters. They call it a surf couch, as if it's a boat. So, um, and drawing. This, is what, this was one of the libraries designed inside the park. We can see the drawings of it and the pictures of the library. These are two representations of the tents, which are not like the tents you buy from the from a shop, but uh, people created with everyday objects and the pictures of the tents. Uh, this one I love. Um, they find this bunkers from somewhere, I don't know what. So people created this small dormitory to sleep on it. And <coughs> and this is a small uh, chess table. And it's drawn.
Actually, for this workshop, I wanted to invite each of them to present their own projects that you can um, ask more questions about their projects, but because of the budget crisis, uh, I end up representing all of them myself. So this was the um, stage for people, like free stage that people were talking, and this is the drawing. Um, the second project I want to talk about is um, org, which in English is Dispossession Maps. Um, Networks of Dispossession was a collective formed inside Gezi Uprising because it was um, so related with the urban issues of Istanbul. They decided to map which uh, companies are working, which companies, uh, which capitals are supporting, which urban projects, etc. So during 2013 and 2014, anyone could join their collective with the information. Or when you read something in the newspaper, you can add this information to their network. When I say, um, let me show. So what we see here is that you keep uploading information. Here it says the third bridge. So you see all these uh, blue dots and black dots are the firms, holdings, or companies related with that construction. So you keep uploading information about the mega projects and then create these maps and you can see like how all the companies and all the capital is sort of related to each other. So how a newspaper is tied strongly to this construction. And then they keep producing these maps and combining these maps. Like now it says like a highway project and then there is a metro project and then there is an um, airport project and then you have the maps of um, one company, you type in one company and it shows you like which project it's connected with. And then you can see um, the media's engagement with this project. So, um, it started as an artistic project, but in the end it became so big that now academicians and anthropologists and sociologists are using it for data and for information. And um, it's really easy to create. I, I went to their workshop once. Um, it's called Graph Commons, Graphic Commons. So you can get this application or the map system free online. You download it to your computer and it shows you how to upload data. So you keep uploading data and it keeps creating this uh, maps and modules to show um, here you can see the televisions and newspapers uh, connected to a construction uh, company and it shows like which construction it's related to. Their website, uh, you can note that it's also in English and they explain quite good their project. And in the end, uh, they sort of combined 30, uh, 393 projects, 433 comp corporations, and 45 governmental institutions, along with thousands of connections between these actors of dispossession. It's, it's a little bit complicated, but did you understand? The project, yeah. So after this project, they also created a second map called a disposition map of uh, minorities. So they also investigated in Turkey, like how Armenian um, properties, how Greek Turks properties, or now how Kurdish villages, etc., changing hand according to this dispossession project of the state and of the government. Um, 
The third project I want to talk about is in this website. I wish we had internet for this. It's called Bakman. And how it started was, um, it actually started in our, our tent, like the tent we were sharing. And people were um, shooting a lot of videos, right? But when the uprising was, uh, we, we were thinking that this will be over and we will not get hands to all this video people are uh, shooting. So we put an open banner. We bought like big terabytes of external disk and we said we invite everyone who wants to share their um, shootings, we will have this uh, place to gather all of them. It was called Video Occupy. So they collected all the images during this period, but of course uh, people didn't know how to reach them afterwards. So and it was almost impossible to download it all. Even they tried like uploading them to uh, websites like you send it or Dropbox, etc. It was too big to manage. So what they did inside this collective, they came out um, Bakma Collective, and they created this website. And as you can see, you can see the dates of the videos, categories, tags, keywords, time of the day, etc. So you can search according to this uh, tags. Uh, you can watch all of them, and it also gives you the opportunity to edit it online on this website. So you don't have to download it to your computer. You can go directly to the website, and it has its own tool. Um, so they are all um, copyleft, like nobody is claiming copyright for this video. So you can take them, edit them, modify them, and upload it back to the website. So people are using this uh, data of videos to create their own videos. And it's not only about that period of uh, protest. They are still continuing the project. Every time there is something social is going on or a protest is going on, they keep uh, up uploading the videos. There are also um, some parts that you can find texts or uh, other material. The last project I want to talk about is like this, um, a project that I really liked because um, right after the uprising a lot of artists were asked to represent this uprising in the art field and nobody wanted to do it. Like that representation was so heavy and we need time to reflect upon it. We just didn't want to like exhibit some pictures or do something about it. Um, there's a um, art space, artist run art space called Apartment Project in Istanbul. And Sarda Asal, who is like um, the founder of this place, wrote a really emotional letter to, to all the artists. And she said that um, we felt something that we never felt before. We witnessed something that we didn't witness before. And I don't know how to express it. I don't know what to do with it. So I'm making this open call for all the artists who wants to participate and to decrease this emotional um, burden of this. Let's make it a book um, notebook project. You know that when it's a notebook, it's easier that you can sketch, you can take notes. It doesn't have to be a, like artwork. It's a notebook. So she gave us like four or five months to prepare and she only gave the dimensions of the books, like not smaller than this, not bigger than this. And in the end, 80 artists replied to this project. And she made uh, this great collection of notebooks from artists. And it was exhibited in Berlin, in Istanbul, and I think now it's in Dusseldorf, but it's a really great co um, connection, uh, collection. <clears throat> I will just want to show you some examples, uh, pages from different notebooks. So this was how it was exhibited on tables and one notebook next to another. So this is an example. I choose them as an example. So uh, an artist friend decided to make it like accordion books. 
and it's a collage of photographs and um, images from the uprising. But in the end, when you open it, you can see a writing saying that now everybody has a story to tell. So when you open it, you see this phrase on it and some pictures around it. But uh, uh, most of the notebooks were created after she announced this uh, project. This project, yeah. Some people had them, but yeah, a lot of them were like looking backwards. That's why mm -hmm. I called it "How to Remember," mm -hmm. like how yeah. each person were remembering it. So this is another example created by another artist and her uh, son. So they made this uh, two weeks project. They keep going to the park. And the kid was collecting some leaves, some objects, and she was combining these objects and drawings with um, some stories and created a box-like notebook uh, with their notes and stories. Another one is um, from another woman artist that um, she wrote her own poetry and some designs, uh, some moments that she remembers. Mm. This was another interesting book that um, a really famous, like established uh, Turkish artist was invited to make this big exhibition in a really important art space and she had to answer during the uprising. So she put her emails to the curator and the creator's responses to her emails. So she describes that she, she doesn't feel like she can create anything at that moment. Um, she's inside something much bigger than her existence. So she cannot think about art and please excuse me from the exhibition. And the curator insists on like, you should join, you should do something about it. And she keeps saying like, I can't even think, like I'm only running away from the police or chopping tomatoes, like I can't create anything. And in the end, like, you see these 10 emails going back and forth. But of course, after a 10 days gap, because when the heated moments, she's not responding to the creator. And in the end, creator asks, like, can we put this, like, emails at least? So then she makes this notebook about this emailing. Um, it's Hale Tengar with Rene Blok. <laughs> this is another one I really like. Um, it's again a notebook with drawings and etc. But um, it's I don't know how to say it. Um, it's the police is what is it called the job we call it. But it loses its power, you know, like it's sort of soft. And because of it, you cannot turn the pages of the notebook. You can only like secret the soft because it's repressing, um, uh, pressuring the the pages. This is another project that um, a friend gets obsessed with the same police that she keeps seeing because she's living next to the park and she keeps seeing him after the uprising. So she starts to draw uh, the police's portrait every day. So she keeps drawing the portrait of the police and it's a book of the same police drawn over and over again. This is another one I love, that um, this artist actually took a briquette. Uh, briquette? Yeah. yeah. The, the payment stone. Yeah. The payment stone from the park just to have a memory in his house. When he was asked to create a notebook, as if it's a gun, you know, they hide guns or like drugs inside the books carving. He carved and put this uh, payment stone inside the book. This was a really poetic one by, um, by an artist that explaining, they kept telling us that Boogeyman doesn't exist when we were a kid. And now I'm a grown up and I actually know Boogeyman's exist. A poetic way of like um, criticizing the suppression and abstract Boogeyman drawings. This is another one, really aesthetic. I really love this one. You see this like tiny little lines, and it's actually a sentence saying that I forgot my tent in the park. 
And when you come in the middle of the book, there is this tent shape in the middle. And it's talking about like how inside an occupation like this, tent becomes your private space. And you are in a such public area and you have like small privacy. But also like when you go back to your house, you miss that tent. You miss being inside those people. This is another one that um, sort of uh, every time you turn a page, the, the people are changing their heads and their positions. It's one of the uh, last ones uh, that's actually talking about hope and upcoming days, not only memories. And I want to show what I did for it. <laughs> So when I look back, for me, one of the most impressive things that I don't usually paint anymore, but uh, the weird togetherness of everyday objects. Like you are in the park and you suddenly see a cable with water bottle and then you have bananas and then fire extinguisher and then you have a tent and pay. You know, this weird natural um, and still lives coming from the uprising. So or like you have this cleaning bottles but inside them there are antidotes for the gas and people keep filling it with milk and leaving there you have lemon vinegar to clean your face from the gas and for me it was like going back to my school times and doing like still lives but with this re I called it the resistance objects fire extinguishers and etc and you have the barricades with like plugs and boxes and everything. Yeah, more or less it was like this. So um, when this project was over when there were like 80 artist books from 80 different artists, um, she wanted to make a catalog. But it was really hard to gather all this information, like 80 different artists, and how are we going to do it? So I became the editor of the book, and we sort of created some chapters. And I also wanted to talk about these chapters because we realized that there were some repetitive feelings and repetitive themes between the artists. The first one was the impossibility. Everybody was talking about the impossibility to represent it in an artwork, but how they feel relaxed because it's a notebook, because it's not a big artwork. So uh, this Im impossibility was the first theme. The second one was like the impossibility of creating an artwork. And there were some like sort of how did we come here, looking backwards, like how this movement started and uh, some of them were talking about death, pain, dark days like bruises, heroes, martyrs and etc. They were really poetic ones, only poetry and abstract paintings and then as a last category I can mention hopeful ones like looking at the future and um, talking about what we have learned. And uh, there were, of course, a lot of them um, sort of like diaries, like dates and small stories and small drawings. Um, lastly, uh, I want to mention something that I did. I don't know like, if any of you came to my performance a week ago, but I'm going to repeat it tomorrow at 5 again here if you want to come. Um, I don't really do performance, I do video most of the time, but after the surprising I, I felt a lack, like a lack that I want to talk about but I don't know how sort of thing. So thinking about like what was this lack was nobody was talking about emotions. 
when the uprising was over or when the movement was going on, everybody was talking about like how are we going to continue academically, like politically, what does this mean, who participated, who were the social groups, what are we going to do now? But we witnessed something that um, changed all of us in a couple of nights, so uh, I decided to tell the story of emotions, like what, how do you feel during an uprising? how your emotions are changing. So it's a, we call it a lecture performance, but I'm actually telling a story, like 45, 50 minutes, about an uprising and how your feelings change during an uprising. Um, as I said, like, these are the projects are um, striking my attention because how they use the archive or, or like the remembrance of an important moment and yeah, how they are treating this archives. That's it from me. Okay. I want to add about this uh, situation that art for artists it's hard to realize some artwork because um, uh, I think uh, we, we had here um, the same feeling, feelings. Um, and um, I think it's because uh, the uh, protest, the, all this situation, it's also the way of creativity, not only of artists, but of a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And um, we had in Maidan, and also in, uh, a few years ago in Orange Revolution, a big, um, a lot of creativity of just simple people, mm -hmm. a lot of caricatures, installations, and mm -hmm. they were mm -hmm. really great. And, um, and maybe <laughs> in this situation, artists feel that um, he or she cannot um, be better, like then just pull people together, mm -hmm. then just this situation could um, inspire people. Mm -hmm. And in Maidan, we had uh, this uh, New Year tree, uh, you saw this image, I think, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, where everyone can put uh, his or her own picture or some mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, this is uh, the same bar cards were also like a big installation, so impressive. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's also hard to make something then in the gallery or for book because you cannot um, like reach this uh, power of this uh, creativity mm -hmm. of uh, protest. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we had also um, some artistic projects projects during Maidan. Um, for example, uh, Lisa Komenko is an artist. She made a um, portrait of people, just every people who wanted mm -hmm. to Maidan, and then mm -hmm. gave to. To them, and then a group of artists. Um, when uh, um, people were in hospitals, they came to to, to, to uh, visit people, and they wanted to hear their own story and draw something in this uh, subject. Mm -hmm. so, and they also had uh, some exhibitions after devoted to Maidan. But my uh, own uh, impression was that, I, like I said, that these exhibitions don't like they something happened that in my mind it was too, too impressive but when it's in the gallery it's lost their power and it's hard to make something better than it is. I don't know if it's like only making better than it but um, no, it happened it yeah, yeah. in Turkey as well like nobody wanted to do anything right after but it's not a ban or I don't say we shouldn't do it because in the end I find myself doing something after mm -hmm. reflecting and thinking about it and slowly people started to create things but of course it shouldn't be just representing it in, in a gallery or museum, just photography or something. And as you said that, I don't know here but it was a little bit different between art scene, like visual art and contemporary art scene and theater music. Um, and cinema sectors. Mm -hmm. So from the cinema sector, a lot of people did a lot of documentaries, like right away they reacted and they created documentaries. Uh, a lot of people from theater made like plays and performances to entertain people inside the park, music people were giving concerts, etc. The most shy ones were like visual arts and contemporary art, they were like waiting on the backstage and you don't have that um, public image either, you know, when you're a theater actor. If you appear in the square, mm -hmm. it's good for publicity of the moment, you know, like this actor or this director is coming to, to the square, etc. 
But if you're a contemporary artist, like nobody knows you already. Like whatever you are going to do wouldn't help the uh, the legitimacy of the movement. Um, yeah, there were even uh, as I showed in the websites, there was even. Um, photography albums are published and music albums that the songs created inside the movement were um, published and a lot of people created a lot of things but as I said they're like cinema, theater and music or literature sometimes but the contemporary art scene are still like not sure about creating anything even they are the most engaged ones with the movements, but they don't want to um, be there as, as artists themselves. And it was a really funny story because a performance <coughs> artist appeared in the like seventh day and she started to cut herself and everybody was like, we are here like happening so many great things and you are again coming here and cutting yourself, <laughs> come on. Is the same, yeah? <laughs> yeah well, almost. Same. Yeah, almost the same, yeah. <laughs> The girl who who was uh, washing um, the ground uh, mm. on Maidan in winter, and she was in this, um, you know, um, national like slipping dress. Uh, mm. uh, yeah, ethic yeah. with ethical yes. this, um, mm. Yeah, ethnic. Uh, yeah, it is ethnic uh, pattern. But with ethnic pattern, and of course with yellow and blue <laughs> a stripe in her hair, and she was. Yeah. But she is someone uh, already known and popular. No, not, not so uh, known, but she. I think she. Uh, she thinks uh, that she's an artist. And, uh. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, don't you think that you had a chance to pause and reflect and not do anything about this uprising? And you said you, you can. It's kind of a luxury, yes, that you can think for a long while. Uh, how was your experience, how can you use it artistically or not. But in Ukraine it was a little bit di different, I guess, because uh, because the revolution it was like victorious, yes, and mm -hmm. the new, uh, a new power came into, uh, into being and Maidan became a part of a new national narrative. So mm -hmm. it, uh, we couldn't not represent it in the media, in the, in the cinema, in the documentaries, mm -hmm. but there was a very strong uh, demand for these representations, and it was not on, not only from from below but from above also. So mm -hmm. uh, basically, yes, the artists were uh, also could do nothing about Maidan, and we also felt this kind of inability to to produce something uh, something of artistic value on the topic of Maidan. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were a lot of exhibitions, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of uh, like uh, documentary exhibitions and artistic also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if uh, the if the things were different, if we had uh, the situation like you had in Turkey when it wasn't uh, uh, a failure, but it wasn't a, 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 an absolute success either. Yes, uh, then the only group that uh, had a uh, uh, maybe an opportunity to form the image of the, mm. the, the uprising of you uh, is yourself, the not not the power, because uh, here it, it was all about Maidan, the, the mm -hmm. next year mm -hmm. after Maidan. So it was overproduced, these images, mm -hmm. this uh, the reflections, even the artistic ones. So it, it it's a bit different, I guess. Maybe. I understand your point, but don't think like um, Turkey was also similar, not from the power. The power party is the still same and they are trying to represent us yes. as uh, yeah. alcohol drinkers, yeah. prostitutes, blah, blah, atheists. And, uh, but on the other hand, there's a weird situation inside the all other opposition that everybody claims they did Gezi, they did the uprising. So everybody is referring to the same situation with different intentions. Like they're um, hyper nationalists claiming the same thing. They're like radical leftists claiming the same thing. And when I look at it, like the first night, there was only 15 people there. And if you read the mag magazines and articles, everybody was there. Like if you start to count like who claims to be there first night, you will find like 10,000 people <laughs> claiming that they were there the first night, but it's not true. So yeah, like everybody is claiming um, some piece of it because it's sexy, because it's like it has a 
mobilization value, it has still have these connotations. But I understand your point, like it's not that much connected with parliament politics and the change, our president didn't run away from the country, so it didn't have that much direct effect. So um, everybody has more flexibility to, to rethink about it and reshape it as an experience. So it's still an ongoing process, yes? It's not too, too late to, uh, to reflect on it? No, no, I think it will, people will reflect on it like upcoming 30 years because nothing will, similar will happen in 30 years. Um, I think I will keep on reflecting on it because it was so extraordinary that it's once in a lifetime experience so you keep going back. And it's also funny because like I, when we get drunk and talk with friends, you know, you start to remember things like, and even though we share the same tent or same table, we cannot believe like how different experiences we had with a really close friend. And we keep telling like, ah, weren't you there? Ah, where were you at that moment? So this memories and remembering keeps coming back. And um, I uh, saw your performance, but I was late, maybe half an hour, so maybe tomorrow we will repeat it from the beginning. But uh, what I um, like or imagine that this, uh, really you uh, try to represent it, say, it's like a human experience, universal mm -hmm. things. Um, because um, very often and mostly um, all, the, all the time, the experience of Maidan is um, a lot of people represent to, uh, some political um, part, political um, like, um, not only parties but uh, they were right wing or left or some groups what they, they do and what political color of this and uh, but um, the um, I think very important uh, thing that there were a lot of people and uh, they made this um, power who didn't um, connect themselves with any political um, like group. Mm -hmm. they, for example, uh, early in the morning, it was possible to meet uh, just women who went to, make, to help with uh, medicines or with food, and they didn't think they are left or they are right, or they uh, or mm -hmm. what they, like, they uh, just want to participate to help, and this is, um, this emotion, these emotions you, represented in your text mm -hmm. and the, when people it's about an old woman who start to cry and to give all the money mm -hmm. so in these stories they like um, it's like a um, basis I think of this protest mm -hmm. because uh, um, mm -hmm. then very easy to manipulate uh, this uh, uh, in the other level but uh, if not uh, the simple people just uh, Go, it will be not a protest. So, mm. and it's very important to, uh, to uh, represent this. Uh, mm. Yeah, I mean, that's why I did it. I also believe in this. I mean, um, I'm a politically engaged person and I wanted to change some people inside the protest, of course. I'm not like all politics are bad. But I also feel that there's a common experience happening all around Europe and the world, like uh, we are sharing the same experience. And also like people used to tell their stories, like this uh, tradition of storytelling, right? People were like traveling from one country to another and telling these epic stories. And this was somehow how the knowledge was transferred from one geography to another. So. I sort of try to go back to that basis of, of storytelling and like distribute the world here, there, I give this feeling to people like this is what you can feel or what you already felt. I find it important because like we can talk politics all the time. I'm talking politics all the time. Like I, I'm going to meetings three times a week. <laughs> But then there is another thing, like something you felt, and uh, it's really special and um, something worth sharing with people. Also, uh, during Maidan event, there were a lot of artists who were uh, doing uh, 
different stuff, so like uh, sitting in the hospitals with vic uh, victims, like uh, mm -hmm. helping with food, and they even didn't tell anybody that they're artists, and uh, well, like I know a lot of them, mm -hmm. like, and uh, maybe half and half of year after they start like doing something like in an art way, so mm -hmm. they were reflected, and I mean like contemporary art. Yeah, yeah. No, because like it's a moment that you feel nothing is important or than anything other, you know, like. Uh, Taking the garbage out as important as tomatoes. That's as important as like something artistic. Everything is like we need to do it all. So um, and also, as you said in the beginning, like this common thinking of people is so strong. You cannot reach it. I mean, you cannot react before them. So I will tell a story that I loved a lot. Uh, at some when they kicked us out from this park. So police closed it for a month, like they closed it like, like this. Mm -hmm. If someone enters there, as they were thinking, it will, it will start again. So it was all closed, like nobody could get into it. And then one day after too much, like people were complaining about it, they opened it. And they opened it saying that we fixed everything because the people destroyed the park, they fixed everything. So the first people who were entering the park, they took out their shoes. You know, in Turkey, it's the tradition. We don't get into the house with shoes. So people take out their shoes not to make it dirty. So it, it was a really funny moment that uh, they were joking with the government and they were joking with the police entering the park without their shoes. So it's so tidy and fixed, so we shouldn't step on it. And. Um, a second moment, like as a collective action, or you can even call it a performance, the prime minister in the fourth or fifth day of, uh, of the uprising said that, call your children back home. I'm calling to the mothers, call your children back home. Half an hour later, 100 mothers were there saying, like, the mothers are here as well. So we are not calling our children back. So you know, like, Nobody was planning these kind of things. It was just happening from this collective thinking, collective mind, um, like somehow doing it. Um, yeah, and it was more effective than cutting yourself in the park, you know. <laughs>